All right. I hope you enjoyed our segments on global breaking news and on sports. Up next, we have our health contingent, and Grant has something for us on a brilliant new innovation out of the always innovative Google DeepMind in London. Uh, this time, it's a protein folding algorithm called AlphaFold. Tell us all about it, Grant. Sure. Um, I guess before we go into what they're actually doing, I guess maybe the why is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so protein folding is a really interesting problem in biology today. Uh, essentially, we, we generally know that uh, we go from DNA to an amino acid sequence, and then an amino acid sequence is just essentially a... Well, you might have yeah. to back up there a second even. Uh, that, uh, so, so, uh, so proteins... These are the kinds of they're they're everything that does work in our body, right? Basically, of course. And so, a, different kinds of proteins make up our skin, allow us to see, and everything. They create do. enzymes, which have you know uh, chemical functions in the body, digesting, breaking things down, building things up. Um, they're fundamental to essentially every single biological process in every single living organism. And and the particular configuration of all of these proteins is encoded in our DNA. And slight variations in those DNA sequences can lead to slight differences in protein function or of course. maybe even a totally ineffective protein. Right? Exactly. And so the basics of a protein is a long string of amino acids all joined together in a linear fashion. And once that whole string is put together, kind of like a string of beads, it folds into a, a three-dimensional structure. And uh, that three-dimensional dimensional structure is a really critical part of how a protein works. It's course, important yeah. for, for what makes the protein tick. Um, if a protein were to fold incorrectly, it doesn't work at all, and it's junk. Um, in fact, a lot of diseases are a result of proteins perhaps folding in incorrectly. That could be because of a, a mutation, so there's a, a, a wrong amino acid in that string of beads. Um, it's like sickle cell anemia. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so a problem in, in biology is to try to predict from the known amino acid sequence, that's an easy enough thing for us to figure out these days with uh, genetic sequencing. But uh, if we know the, the sequence of the amino acids, how do we predict what the 3D structure is um, of a protein? Uh, it's actually a really challenging problem. Um, and there are a couple of ways that we can find out the shape of a protein empirically. Uh, there are a few biological methods that we can use, but those methods are slow, they're expensive, and uh, they're really difficult. So. At the moment, we have protein structures for around half the proteins in the human body. But of course, we, we need structures for everything else. Now, uh, there is this extra sort of paradox um, known as Leventhal's paradox. And that essentially states that in order to, if we were to try to guess the random structure of uh, a protein given its amino acid structure, it would take more than all of the time in the known universe in order to generate every possible combination of structure that is that, right. that, that string of, sequ of amino acids is capable of before you'd ar arrive at the correct one. Right. Now, in biology, a string of amino acids folds into the correct shape every time in a matter of milliseconds. So there's obviously some kind of ordered system creating that structure, but we just don't, want to, don't know what it is. We also don't have a really good means of predicting that yet. And so at the moment, there is this um, competition known as CASP, I, th I think you'd say it, C-A-S-P, um, which is essentially a, a biological or a, a scientific competition wherein teams can attempt to predict structures of proteins and that you'd get a score based on how well you do. And every year, everyone is you know, trying to do better than the year before something akin to the ImageNet competitions in, in image recognition. Right. Now, um, this last year, Google entered with uh, a product called AlphaFold, and they essentially used a deep learning framework to design a model that could predict the structure. And they did this by predicting for every single pair of amino acids in a protein's uh, uh, length, they predict the distance that that amino acid would have from every other amino acid in the final folded structure. Mm. And then they also, you know, w once the whole structure is folded together, each amino acid is going to have some molecular bond with, you know, its neighbors. And they also predicted the angle of those bonds. And using those two things together, they could then construct a three-dimensional model of that protein. Right. And um, they actually did exceptionally well. This was the first time that they'd entered the competition. Uh, and 
they blew everyone else out the water. Uh, one of the things that came up was, um, I guess there are 43 proteins that you're asked to predict. Um, the problem that they were specifically focused on was predicting a structure from the ground up. So all you get is the amino acid sequence and you come up with a protein. There are a few other categories, I guess. Uh, and they got 25 of the 43. They were the, the model that got the closest answer. Um, second place got three out of 43. Oh wow. my goodness. So wow. they did it. They, it, I guess it's the same as when deep learning was first moved into into the machine vision. Into machine vision. But it's even more extreme than that because in because so so the so in ImageNet you already mentioned it the kind of machine vision benchmark. I guess it's it's kind of analogous. So, CASP is to uh, protein folding as uh, ImageNet is to machine vision. Correct. And um, when when a deep learning model was entered into this ImageNet. Uh, large-scale visual recognition competition in 2012, that AlexNet algorithm out of the University of Toronto, it was 30%, it has had 30% fewer errors, um, which was huge and everybody took notice. And that was kind of the uh, opening salvo of uh, deep learning that kind of led us to so many people to talking about right. deep learning today, so many different applications. But this is m much bigger gap than that. I mean, that is a well, crazy sure. gap. And I guess maybe that comes down to the fact that, uh, you know, recognizing it, the, the subject of an image is actually a fairly simple task. We can right. all do it. Um, but predicting the structure of a protein given an amino acid sequence is not a simple task, and none of us can do it. In fact, no one oh. can do it. Haven't tried. May, maybe Vince can do tried. it. Haven't tried. Also, <laughs> sort of low key There's on no the other side. He has there. very thick glasses. He can just, he's just like, yeah, you guys can't see how this works. I mean, we all can do it, we just can't do it consciously. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, right. Sorry. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, it was, I think that's perhaps why they did so much better was that. The, the problem that they were trying to solve is one that is sufficiently complex that it's not really solvable by uh, the human mind. And I think a lot of the, the advances that were done in the ImageNet competition prior to deep learning were all sort of hand coding the recognition of spe specific types of structures in images. Whereas in this problem, there was no real way to do that because we, we, you know, we didn't have a really strong sense of how different combinations of amino acids come together. We had a few ideas. We can predict alpha helices and beta sheets. Those are just you know particular types of structures that exist within proteins. But how those things then come together in, in a larger sense and create full tertiary protein sure, structures sure, sure. are not um, not readily accessible to the human. Um, so it's it was pretty impressive. Um, but sort of on the other side of that coin, it's nowhere near complete. Um, so one thing that they use for uh, for assessing how well these models do is a thing called global distance score, uh, also abbreviated to GDT. I'm not really sure why the T is there. Um, and apparently a score of sort of 85 to 90 would make uh, a model do really, really well in, in the real world. Right. Uh, their average score was 63. Yeah. So it's better than it was before. Way We've better. advanced the state of the art, but we're not we're not really done, I guess. Yeah. Great. Uh, do you have a kind of a, a summary <laughs> point? <laughs> not a summary point. I, I'm just, I would love to see what this can teach us about prions. When I talk about, <laughs> when we talk <laughs> about I protein folding. I did not folding, expect that to I be know. what you, you I about, mean, so. if you're going to talk about protein folding, you got to talk about prions. You got to talk about prions. I mean, just as a. For a the Beijings out there, we're not talking about priors. Yeah, it's something prions. completely different. Yeah. <laughs> Not the ors, the ons. Um, yeah, so like just by analogy, when we think about like fibrillation in the heart, that occurs when you're in a local minimum stable state of pacemaker cell firing in the heart, and you just need to kind of shake the board and get the ball to the global minimum, which is a stable heart rate. And the same thing can happen with protein configuration. There could be multiple uh, different stable configurations for a protein folding, and when you... Um, when you get into right. the wrong, the, the local minimum stable configuration, you can end up with something that can be very deleterious to other proteins in the body, and that's a prion. Right. The right. weird, not alive disease, right. um, like Kretzfeld-Jakob's disease, uh, mad cow disease. And uh, I'd be interested to see what, what this model can teach us about prions. But then we've got to the problem where we're looking for, uh, we can predict the structure of a prion. We already know the structure of prions. They've been studied extensively, so we have their three-dimensional structure. Uh, now we're saying, okay, here's the amino acid structure. 
this amino acid should actually generate a correct protein, but it's actually generating this error, error protein, a prion, and that causes disease. And the machine is not ever going to predict the error one. And if it does predict, sorry, the, uh, the yeah, it's not going to predict the error one. And if it does predict the error one, what we really want, the information that we're looking for is why. And figuring out the why within a deep learning framework is notoriously difficult. Yeah, so notoriously I don't know how useful difficult. that's going to be, or at least we're going to have to find some way to interrogate the model. Yeah, super interesting. And I guess also this would also be relevant uh, in addition to bad cow disease, things like uh, beta amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's, I guess, as well. Similar. Potentially, yeah, affecting a lot of people. And so uh, this group, Google DeepMind, if you haven't heard of them, definitely worth checking out. They have come up with uh, year after year of um, benchmark busting results um, across uh, video game playing algorithms first with Atari, um, and that got them acquired by Google. They were just DeepMind before that. Um, and, and with their AlphaGo algorithm, which uh, was able to beat the world's best Go player by far, who recently retired, saying that there's no point in playing Go anymore because uh, you know I know that I can't be better than this entity. Um, on, on Earth. A lot of structural um, biochemists that have seen the writing on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so really, really an innovation uh, coming up from those guys. All right, so uh, that wraps up our health section, and we just have one left for you. It's going to be fun.